So today's topic is uh, conditional PDF and its applications. And then I will uh, do as an, as an illustration of what we have studied uh, an app uh, another application on, and that's actually the maximum likelihood principle. Anyway, let me get through this. Uh, so here the idea is that uh, you have some unknown. So X is some unknown. Uh, then you uh, collect uh, some information on, on a related random variable. So it could be that X is not observable for whatever reason, maybe hard to get to. Uh, so X may have its own density function. And this uh, one way or the other way, we have an idea, but we do collect uh, some information on a, a related uh, variable, say Y. So Y is what we observe, maybe a set of observations or one observation. So the question is, uh, so remember we had a, some density function of X beforehand. So now the question is, can you find the density function of X uh, conditioned on the fact that Y is Y? So this is where we are going to go. So still the density function of X, but conditioned on the fact that Y is Y. So how do we do this? What do we mean by this, uh, etc.? So if you want, this is usually called a priori information a priori PDF, and this is called uh, a posteriori. Remember, if you look at this, the very, the, both, everything is about X in both the cases. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do you use the, so in between we collect some data. So it goes like this, you have uh, to start with, you have, you may have some information on X, we call it FXX. Then you collect the data, uh, some related data, Y. Uh, so we collect it on Y because X may be more complicated or it may be a physical phenomena and uh, some aspects of which you can observe. So that's the data you collect or maybe multiple uh, different variables, Y, Z, etc. But in any case, uh, once you collect the data, so this is the data collected, which is usually the expensive part then the question is, what more can we say about X? Uh, given the data. So this is obviously learning, you can see. In other words, what we are asking is, we still want the density function of uh, X, but given, uh, so when you do this, uh, it may be, uh, you'll get another graph. So you have two different, uh, density functions. So, so, and I'll go through all this in uh, detail with the different examples. So, so this is what the conditional information, conditioned on the fact that some data has, something has been observed. So we are trying to improve our knowledge about X from here to here uh, through, uh, by making use of data. So the question is, even if you observe something, what is the correct way to capture that data and uh, observe it. So that's the uh, portion we are going to look at. So let me start with the uh, distribution function. So remember distribution function of a random variable is the probability of the set of all events such that X sub psi is less than or equal to uh, uh, X, X sub psi. So this is the, or generally we just write it as X less than or equal to X. Uh, so, so if you take this to be an event A, let's look at uh, uh, this one, PAB. PAB of course we know is PAB divided by PB. So for A, I'm going to use this. So probability of X less than or equal to X. And for B, I'm going to use Y between y1 and y2. So this is b, 
this is a so if you want the left side we can remember this is the distribution function of x conditioned on something so we went through this earlier if you recall so we, if you want the left side we can write it like this and the right side we can use this expression here so that becomes pab so i'm going to write it here probability of x less than or equal to x intersection with y between y1 and y2 over a probability of y between y1 and uh, y2 so if you recall we have actually uh, we have uh, expanded things like this the numerator can be written as probability of x less than or equal to x y less than or equal to y2 minus probability of x less than or equal to x y less than or equal to y1 divided by uh, so you can see this is the distribution function of uh, y uh, between y2 and y1 so the both the, uh, obviously look at the numerator that's just the distribution joint distribution function of uh, x so this is so we could write x given uh, b as uh, the joint distribution function evaluated x comma y2 minus uh, the joint distribution function of x y x comma y1 divided by f y y2 minus f y y1 uh, but this we can write in terms of a uh, the joint density function so y goes between y1 and y2 and the, this variable goes between minus infinity to x so i'm going to use u there for that divided by this is just the area under fyy from y1 to y2 all right so what i'm going to do next uh, so this is the distribution function of x conditioned on the fact that y is between y1 and y2 so so this way this is reasonably straightforward so far now what i'm going to do is i'm going to put y1 equal to y i'm going to make these two points very close y equal to y plus delta y and then i'll take the limit as delta y goes to zero let's see what happens so notice that i'll uh, here if y1 and so if y1 is y and y2 is y plus delta y of course you can approximate the denominator as fyy multiplied by delta y and same thing here in the numerator this first integral if this is y1 is y and this is y plus delta y the the first the inside integral will become fxy you will stay as it is y delta y uh, the that's the first integral the uh, inside integral then the outside integral will be on du from minus infinity to x so the key is now notice that the delta y cancels on on the right side so there is no limit to, to take here but on the other hand if you take the limit here uh, y uh, delta y goes to zero this uh, this way you can write it as uh, this way when you push the uh, delta y to zero the right side closes with the left side so you can say this is uh, so we could call this left side to be the conditional uh, pd of distribution function of x given y so let me just uh, rewrite it in the next page so the conditional distribution of x given uh, the random variable y equal to y is minus infinity to x fx y u comma y du divided by f y y so now if you want the conditional density function just take the derivative so i'm going to if this is a distribution function we take the derivative of that and i'm going to call it as uh, this way so the derivative is remember this is the variable so the derivative is with respect to x and here the look at the address here so sometimes it is written as x given y just to uh, both in the address and the variables but the variable is x 
the y is given to be a value small y so we can use the same rule here, uh, to, to to the derivative so the derivative of the top limit which is 1 then wherever the variable of integration we substitute the top limit so you get fx y x comma y derivative of the bottom limit 0 and derivative with respect to this with respect to x there is nothing else so it just turns out to be just this so we get this important formula i'm just going to rewrite it here conditional density function of x given y so sometimes we just write it like this or we can write this as capital y equal to y is the joint density function of x and y divided by f y y so this must be a legitimate density function let's check it so this is the conditional pdf of x given y y equal to y given y means the random variable y has been observed to be some value small y so y is a fixed for y is no longer a random variable here because y is some observation why not so let's see whether this is just to make sure whether this is a density function uh so we we can uh, take the let's see what's the uh, area under this uh, density function uh when you go from minus infinity to plus infinity but remember the uh, so the area of fxy x comma y over fy that's the conditional density function i substituted dx so the denominator goes outside so this becomes 1 over fy y multiplied by the fx y dx but this is nothing but this is the marginal density function of y so f y over f y you get 1 so of course the conditional density function is a uh, uh, density so we get this relation if you want you can write the joint density if you cross multiply you get this expression x given y x given y multiplied by f y y but you could also do it the other way so you get uh, f y given x multiplied by y given x multiplied so all this is true so the joint density function so this is an important relation if you want you can write it in terms of the conditional density function of y given x or in terms of the conditional density function of x given y both are correct so and if you equate this this is also known as the bayes relation for pdfs so i'll just copy the last line so the from the last line you have ff y given x multiplied by fxx is f of x given y multiplied by fy y so in detection estimation theory this formula is uh, useful to compute the a posterior density function of uh, y given x or x given y so x given y is y given x multiplied by fx x either way either way you can write it down so i'm going to use all this to solve the problem so of course conditional uh, mean of uh, x given y equal to y is uh, as before x multiplied by because it is condition you you instead of uh, writing fx x you you use this density function and this mean will turn out to be some function of y because you are only integrating over x and then you find out conditional you can find out the conditional variance of x given y as expected value of x squared given y minus uh, expected value of x given y the whole square the same formula so so the next homework may ask you to find out the conditional uh, mean and variance so before i go into an application let me show you do a simple example so take look at this example
let's say the density function is non zero here so fxy is a constant uh, you can see the area under the density function is 1 and the area of this rectangle is 1 so the fxy is 1 where xy belongs to this area and zero the things so it's a, it's a constant constant is actually 1 so the question is what is uh, let's say fx uh, fx given y what is it so remember fx given y is the joint density function of x and y divided by fyy so basically let's try to find out the two marginals of x and y so fxx is fxy x comma y so for a given x x is somewhere here this is the variation on y right if x is given y what is the limits on y anybody if x, for a given x what should i integrate on y goes from where to where minus x to x minus x to x that's good and the joint density function is 1 so when you integrate you get this x x between 0 to 1 and you can mentally check that's a density function so let's find out fy y so that's the joint density function of x comma y d x so if y is given look at the y is a particular value y could be positive or negative but it would go here or here depending on so what would be the limits anybody y goes from where to where the absolute value of x y yeah absolute value of y right x x goes from um, because you can take care of it separately or together and this is one so the answer is 1 minus y y goes between minus 1 and 1 so if you that will be a triangle like this f y y and uh, if you so if you take the ratio you get this 1 over 1 minus y to be the density function of x but for a given x x is uh, the limits are x is not between 0 and 1 because y is given if y is given look at x x goes from absolute value of y to 1 that's the, so that's the answer so don't carelessly write here as 0 to 1 that's not the answer for x because when y is given you can see when when y is given to be somewhere x x doesn't go from 0 to 1 x only goes from y to 1 uh, so plus or minus 1 it's the same thing etc so, so uh, similarly f y given x will be 1 over 2 y and y going from between 0 to x i guess right y goes from uh, minus x to x actually and uh, now you have the conditional density function you can find out the conditional mean and so on so i am saying uh, similarly f y given x will be f x y x comma y over f x so this is 1 over f x is somewhere here 2 x and but for a uh, uh, when x is given and y goes between uh, y goes between uh, y is less than uh, uh, y y is less than absolute value of x right or the other way absolute value of y is less than x in other words y goes between minus x and plus x so 2x over 2x you get so if you want the expected value of y given x will be what uh, y multiplied by f y given x y given x dy and y goes between minus x to x and so this is going to be integral y over 2x dy minus x to x what's the answer anybody what is the answer to this integral 
Hello? Remember, we are integrating over y. Forget about x. x is like a constant. x is given. So this 2x goes outside. Then the answer will be? This is an odd function over an even 0, right? Similarly, what is the expected value of x given y? So x given y is somewhere here. So this is x multiplied by f uh, x given y. And remember, don't get confused. Y is given, so the integration is with respect to X. And the X go, for a given Y is somewhere here, right? For a given Y, X goes between absolute value of Y to one, right? So if you substitute this, this we have it as one over Y. So this is uh, X divided by one absolute value of y, dx, y to one. So this is, what is it? Uh, x squared by two. So that's one minus absolute value squared by two multiplied by one minus y. So this comes out to be, if I'm right, uh, as the mean. And you do the, so similarly, you just keep doing uh, whatever is the problem. So at least you know the dynamics now, how to find the conditional mean. <clears throat> how to find the conditional uh, density function. Uh, so let me show you a couple of applications of this. And uh, the one of the most useful concepts in a probability theory which gets taken over in statistics is this conditional information. You can see because that's how you update the, your data. When new data comes in, how do you update your old knowledge? So that's learning everywhere conditional density function comes in. The only thing I want to mention is if X and Y are independent, I'm going to ask you this. Then what's the conditional density function of x given y? Anybody? X and y are independent. So what what's the conditional density function of x given y? So that's going to be the joint yes. density function, but the joint density function is the product of the density function because they are independent, divided by f y y by cancel. So you get this makes sense because if x and y are independent, they have no correlation, they have nothing to do with each other. So even if you collect some data on Y, that should not help you to update anything. So the conditional density function of X given Y is the same as FXX if, if they are independent. So that's also a check. So this makes sense. Makes sense since uh, X and Y are independent. Uh, one doesn't influence the other. So of course the conditional, uh, if you, uh, so the moral of the story is, if you're trying to collect some data on X, don't collect the data based on some independent random variable. You need to get data based on some correlated random variable. And that makes complete sense also. I don't know what title to give to this example, but I'm going to call this uh, this way. All right, so the XIs are, uh, look at this problem. 
XIs are Bernoulli random variables. So when, when, remember, Bernoulli means probability of Xi equal to one is uh, small p, and probability of Xi uh, head or tail, right? Xi equal to zero is q. So the way if I write it like this, you know, it's not very interesting. So let me connect this with a physical problem. Listen to me. So think of Xi as the number of eggs that a chicken lays. So the uh, so you have no idea how many eggs the chicken is going to lay, uh, lay at uh, any sometime. So this is n number of eggs. N is the total number of eggs. Xi is going to show you the fate of each egg. So each egg could become a, chi a chick with the probability p, or nothing may happen with the probability q. So if that is the case, what does y represent? Anybody? What does y represent? So n is the total number of x that the chicken is going to lay, which is a random number also. n is not fixed. You cannot tell offhand that tomorrow it's going to lay 2x or 3x or etc. So n is a random variable. x is are random variables. What does y represent physically? Anybody? Number of? Huh? Number of chickens that will live. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. Number of ch chicks that live, Rakim. Okay. I'm going to write the number of survivors, okay. So remember, this is a random variable. X, so we haven't studied something like this, but we are studying now. This is also a ran another random variable. These are Bernoulli. And I'm going to assume n is Poisson for whatever reason. That means probability of n equal to n is e raised to minus lambda, lambda to the power n over n factor. So all this says is that the number of, uh, or you take some, uh, some animal which uh, lays a lot of, uh, in the forest, whatever, uh, a lion, the number of cups are going to be n, but n is a random number, maybe seven, and out of that, for whatever reason, after some time, only four survives, right? So we can associate a probability with each uh, offspring saying it is a probability P of survival. And so Y represents the total number of survivors of the offspring. So we want to find out what kind of distribution Y has. Okay, you understand the problem, right? So what, is, what we want in industry is what is probability of Y equal to N? This is what we want to find out. So I'm going to show you an application of conditional, uh, how the conditional one is used. So I hope you understand the problem first. So you, you have many applications of this sort, right? You have a box coming in. You don't know how many bulbs are there. You don't even know how many bulbs are there. So that's the N. And you know that each bulb or whatever, each fruit is surviving with probability P and not surviving with probability Q. So question is, if you get a box with a random number of uh, how many are good ones? So remember, so what will n minus y represent? Y is sigma xi, i equal to one through n. And what does, uh, physically, what does n minus y represent? Anybody? n is the total number of uh, chicks or the babies. So what, and y are the ones which survive. So n minus y? Number of chickens that didn't survive. Yeah, the offsprings which did not make it. So I, I'm actually going to find the, both are random variables. So I'm going to find their joint density function. Let's see whether we can find this out. All right, so this is equal to, now I'm going to substitute for xi, i equal to one through capital N equal to N, z, which is, uh, n minus y equal to m from the previous line okay but see oh, look at here why this is y y is given to be n so i'm going to substitute here n so this you can write it as summation xi i equal to one through n uh, y equal to n but remember there are too many random variables on the left side xi is a random variable n is random variable and z is n minus y, y is n. 
So this is the same as capital N equal to N plus M, right? I just substituted for Y and put it there. Now look at here, this is like A and this is B. So I'm going to write it as conditional one. So this is an application for you multiplied by PB. So let me write this here. So this is probability of summation Xi, I equal to one through N equal to N condition on N equal to N plus M multiplied by probability of N equal to N plus A. Remember this is Poisson, so we know how to do it. So the joint density function of Y equal to N, C equal to M is from the last line, look at here. So look at the last line, previous page. So it says, uh, look at here, given capital N equal to N plus M. So I'm going to substitute here N plus M. So this now reads summation Xi, I equal to N plus one. This N is random, but conditioned on that the random variable is N plus M. So I'm going to put N plus M here give one n equal to n plus m multiplied by probability of n equal to n plus m. So notice what, uh, this quantity equal to n. Uh, once I, what do you have here at this point has nothing to do with ra this random variable, whether you write it conditioned or unconditional, it's exactly the same. So the left side, when I write it in this form, I can write it as, because there is no more capital N here. So I can write it like this. Of course, if there was a capital N sitting somewhere else, that's a different story. And uh, we, here capital N, we could use this value because it says the capital N is for the time being N plus M. So I substitute N plus M here. Once I do that, there is no more uh, N random variable here. So this quantity is independent of N because the Xi doesn't depend on N. Of course, if Xi was a function of capital N, then you can't do it. Xi's are not a function of N, so we can do it. Now, both the expressions, you know, this is Poisson. So this is e raised to minus lambda, lambda to the power n plus m over n plus m factorial. That's this expression. Here, anybody remember this? If you add a bunch of a binomial, what do you get? I'm sorry, if you add a bunch of Bernoulli's, what do you get? Which is what is happening. We are adding n plus m Bernoulli, independent Bernoulli random variables. We went through this. A binomial. That's a binomial with parameters n plus m comma p. So this random variable is binomial parameter n plus m comma p. So I, that probability is n choose k instead of n I have n plus m factorial divided by k is what? k is this one. k is n factorial. So n minus k is m factorial p to the power k which is n Q to the power N minus M, N plus M minus N, that's M, multiplied by E minus lambda, lambda to the power N plus M over N plus M factorial. So this cancels with this. And the rest of it, I'm going to rewrite, watch me carefully. E raised to minus lambda here, I'm going to put P plus Q here, but P plus Q is one, so it doesn't really matter. So notice I can rewrite now e raised to minus p lambda multiplied by, I have p to the power n, lambda to the power n. So I have p lambda to the power n over n factorial. Then I have e raised to minus q lambda, q lambda to the power m over m factorial. Look at what we started with. Look at the top of the page. We wanted the joint density function of y equal to n and z equal to m. Look at the bottom. I have one, one function in terms of n, another function in terms of m. And both look like Poisson with the parameter p lambda and q lambda. So we have a, a, a recent, a decent result. So the result is, if you have such a problem, then those two random variables are independent.
so probability of uh, y equal to n and z equal to m is probability of y equal to n multiplied by z so this is poisson with parameter p lambda this is poisson with parameter q lambda so this is a, a famous result in queuing theory if you have uh, if you have a, a one queue and if people uh, different types of uh, let's say male and female join uh, into a streamline and if they come in with the probability p and 1 minus p then the sub queues will be also poisson with parameters p lambda and q lambda in any case so the interesting thing is the x that survive and the x do not survive they are independent that's what it says and if the total number of x is poisson then the number of uh, x that survive also is a poisson uh, the other one also is poisson but the, what with the different parameters remember the originally n was p lambda and these two are two uh, so this has been divided into uh, two uh, two groups one that survives that is this distribution uh, and doesn't survive that has got uh, this distribution so so it just uh, um, by natural selection it goes into this form so this is one application so let me do a little more interesting application so this will be so i have an unknown coin i don't know what's the i don't know whether it is biased or unbiased so uh, i call it learning from data so if somebody gives you a coin you have no idea of course you can go ahead and assume a probability of p is half but that you have no basis so p is unknown so at this point from what we have learned in this class this is a good example to start with so we may say that i have no idea i say may saying that p could be anywhere from 0 to 1 in other words p is uniform from 0 to 1 now if you tell me you no know, look that's on, uh, you don't have to go that far it may be uniform somewhere around 0.5 that's also fine so you can redo this example and let me start uh, so if i don't even show you the coin you have no idea how the coin looks i say i have a coin i made a coin and you certainly know there is no reason to assume it may be an unbiased nice uh, clean coin right so what we could uh, what you could ask me is to collect uh, collect give uh, you use that coin and give me some data so let's say we toss it uh, n times and we observe the k hits so this is something a uh, data this is the data you are collected you see k hits in n uh, tosses right so i'm going to call this an event this this so you perform this experiment this is the experiment so remember setting up an experiment in this case it is trivial but generally setting up an experiment which gives you some insight into the what you are looking for is something like this so this is something certainly something you can do toss a coin and see how many uh, n times and see how many times you get head so now the question is how do you use this to update your knowledge so as i said we will call this a priori so if you go back to your notes we had this formula if remember a itself is Uh, based on this coin so we could say to compute the probability of a we could we have uh, go back to few lectures back we have uh, developed uh, this formula when uh, p is a is based on p p itself is uh, a random variable so it's going to be probability of a given p multiplied by fpp p goes from 0 to 1 whatever it is it's a very rich 
So here, once P is fixed, we know that uh, the getting K hits in N tosses is uh, binomial. So this is N choose K. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is a particular experiment. So this is not even binomial. This is something like a, like a sequence. Right, head, head, tail, head. So this is your A, condition on P. So uh, if the P is given to be, so the, the, K, the coin is supposed to have some P, then this is going to be small P multiplied by small P, Q, et cetera, Q. So if you tally all the P's, this is going to be P to the power K because we know that we have observed K heads and one minus P to the power N minus K. And this is one. So this is going to be simply zero to one uh, p to the power k, 1 minus p to the power n minus k dp. And uh, if you recall, this is, uh, you can integrate it in many ways. Simply substitute p equal to sine squared theta. But this is integrated, tabulated well. This is uh, coming from uh, beta distribution. So I believe this is, if you work it out, this will turn out to be this constant. So that's just a constant. So that's the probability of A. Now, what we want is, what is the probability of, uh, I, I know we have uh, developed the formula. So what can you say, how do you update this information? This is where we are going to go. So just to remind you, remember we, we can look at this one very quickly. So this is like probability of A given B is B given A. So that's the probability of X1, X2 given A multiplied by PA uh, divided by PB, which is probability of X between X1 and X2. And if I make X1 equal to X, X2 equal to X plus Delta X, uh, the denominator is, of course, you can see fxx because this is just the distribution function of x2 minus x1. But if these two are close, this is simply this. And uh, here the numerator would be what? Uh, fx of x2 given a minus fx of x1 given a multiplied by pa. But that also you can write it as density function of x given a from x to x plus delta x or multiplied by pa divided by fxx delta x. But the numerator you can write it as simply this multiplied by delta x. So of course you can see that you can write it like this. Delta X cancels, right? Because this numerator is this density function multiplied by Delta X when Delta X is small. When Delta X is small, this becomes now X equal to X. Why am I writing all this? So we want this formula and we can use, so from here we have X given A is probability of A given X equal to X. I'm cross multiplying this FXX divided by P. So look, this is what, look at the top line and bottom line. I'm go, all I'm going to do is replace small x by P. Uh, so this is F P given A is probability of a given P equal to P multiplied by FPP divided by PA. 
but uh, the the first one is pk 1 minus p to the power n minus k because this a is the specific experiment you got head the tail uh, head head the tail etc some sequence that is this uh, this is 1 and p goes between 0 and 1 divided by p a v uh, probability of a we had computed here it is this number so i'm going to suggest uh, plug it in here that's going to be k factorial n minus k factorial uh, divided by uh, n plus 1 so that's going to come up here so if i write this up it will be look like this so if you plot it that will look like something like this i hope my my coefficients are correct so look at what we have done what we have managed in this class is this uh, this is where we started with this is our ignorance this shows our ignorance right ignorance in the sense that uh, about the coin of course we had no idea what type of coin it was then we performed an experiment what the experiment gave was a, a uh, we, it gave us a sequence we saw head head tail tail head so we saw this sequence this is what we called a then we use that a so uh, this is our new knowledge updated uh, uh, knowledge about the coin or this is the a posteriori pdf so this is usually what hap this is why you collect the data you collect the data to improve your understanding so from a uniform we went up to here so this is this is where the conditional thing in other words you are always going to condition on the latest data of course if the data is garbage then everything is uh, useless and this by the way is a beta distribution so from uniform we went to beta remember in the beginning i threw away all these num uh, names at you beta gamma this and that but now beta happens to be a physical so if you take an unbiased uh, if you take a coin and perform an experiment and update its pdf from uniform it will go to beta now remember if you didn't do this experiment you will be living with uh, the you will be living with the uniform density function if because you did this experiment remember this is why accelerator they build all these things and do the experiment to get uh, uh, updated knowledge about whatever they are looking for so this is where we are so whatever we are going to predict next will you use this density function or you will use this density function which one the new one that's the whole point of collecting the data so that to make an informed next decision we will use this density function we won't go back to the past so let me do that and conclude this experiment so of course this is the conditional density function of p given the data this is how we updated the data so notice there is a lot of understanding and some mathematics goes on into all this you cannot do uh, this without uh, obviously what we learned here so the mathematics is crucial however hard you say i know the what is going on in terms of physics that's not enough how do you how do you use the data to update your knowledge so so we will use this so the, this is uh, this is what the prediction is the prediction is let's say somebody we lost the coin or whatever so, so the, uh, or what it is if you toss this coin again what is the likelihood that a head will show up that's the question we haven't tossed it let's say we are going to toss it next year so that's the prediction economic prediction or whatever so we are going to use this to predict the probability of a head in next to toss so let me call that to be uh, 
B. B is the head in next toss. So we haven't tossed it. Toss the coin. We, if you toss it, question is, what is the probability of B? So remember, again, we are dealing with a random coin. So you could say probability of B is, we'll use that same formula. B give, P given B multiplied by F P P D P zero to one. So this is, remember, this is about prediction because what will happen next? So look at this again. So we have a, I wrote here FPP, but this is clearly about the past and we spent all this data to come from here to here. So again, will I use at that stage, will I use the old density function or the new one? The new one. So even though I wrote this like this, the density function to be used here is the modified density function of P given A. That was the whole point of collecting the data. So this is you use the experimental outcome to predict it. So what we are doing is whatever is the experimental outcome, I'll write it here. Use experiment, use experimental outcome. What is the experimental outcome? When we did the experiment, we got a sequence like this. Whatever you got a sequence, we use this, this is your A. Uh, so we are going to use that to predict about what will happen, what is the probability of getting ahead the next time. So let me plug in that probability. Remember, I have already computed it. So I'm, I'm not going to do the uniform, but I'm going to plug in this expression into there. Right? So remember, this probability is easy. Look at B. B is the head in next toss. Given given the coin has uh, the probability is p what is the pro what is the probability of b given p that's easy what is it p that's just p right this is p and for this i am going to use this complicated formula let me plug it in and uh, so this is not p because this is more complicated p could be any value and it obeys this distribution function so you can see the uh, the difference that this class makes before the class, you would say this is P also. Everything is P. So things are not that simple. Uh, professor, so someone also mentioned that in the comments, shouldn't it be like P, B given A? If you're also considering that A happened? Yeah, so is this, of course, see, in other words, the question was, look at here again, my argument. P, B given, uh, B, uh, if given A is already here, we are bringing this, but I'm saying if the- No, we're talking about the left-hand side. Shouldn't it be like P of B given A? So that like we're conditioning a- like Whichever, an whichever way condition. notation you can write, uh, but A has nothing, remember A is a past, listen to my argument. The coin is tossed independently. So uh, the, the fact that whatever sequence happened before has nothing to do with what is going to happen next. In other words, they are not directly influencing. All that is going to tell you is some information about the overall P distribution. Remember the fundamental assumption in tossing a coin, the coin tossings are independent, which means the coin itself has no memory. It is not, the coin itself is not influenced by the fact that a specific sequence happened before. But no, the fact not. that the very a specific sequence happened, you are able to use that to update your knowledge about the coin from here to here. That's where the AI has helped you. So given P, like B and A are independent, but without P, B and A aren't independent. So the left-hand side is supposed to be P of B given A, but since they're not independent, we cannot separate. So we're conditioning it on P. They, they are, so they are. Of P, B and A are independent, right? No, they, they are independent, right? That's what I'm trying to tell you. So in a simple coin, co coin tossing experiment, any coin, the coins are tossed independently. So uh, the next toss is not going to be influenced by what occurred before the specific sequence. Of course, it's the same coin. Remember, it's only your ignorance. If somebody had the coin is, the coin is not changing anything. The coin has a specific value of P, except it is unknown to you. 
Suppose the P is known, then none, then none of this is an issue, right? We know what. Suppose I tell you P is 0.49, then there is nothing to uh, compute and so on. P is still there. It's, P is an unknown number, but it's just unknown to us. So how we are updating our, uh, initially we are saying, so P could be anywhere from zero to one. Then we perform an experiment. That experiment is used to update our knowledge about P. So from a uniform, we come to, what is it? Uh, uh, what did I say? Beta. Beta is where, so that's about the P. But remember, P is just one fixed number, which none of us know. So then we again toss, then it had, if you, the question is, if you toss the coin again, of course, if you toss the coin again, it has nothing to do with what sequence came in before. That's the way the coin operates. So B only depends on whatever is its value of P. And if that value of P is known, then probability of B given P is P. And except here, if you, if you hear this, we have the freedom. If you want to use all the knowledge that we have the, from the previous sequence, then we can use the conditional uh, PDF of P given A instead of FPP. So if you, if I do that here, though this is going to be P and my uh, PDF was, what was it? Uh, yeah, I had it as N plus one factorial. These are constants, so we can pull it outside. K factorial so this is the constants go outside again you you can use the exactly the same integral to simplify this uh, but the here it is p, p to the power k plus one that's the with the, the, these two together. So again, you can use the binomial table to simplify this. And if you write this and all my, um, cancel with these things, I, I believe this will turn out to be n plus two factorial. This will be k plus one factorial n minus k factorial. So if you do this, you get uh, a, a simple result like this. So you can see the power of the experiment. We, the experimental data is used here. This is from the experiment. Because the experiment said we've tossed n coin and we got k heads. So what it says is, if you look at this, if you toss a coin 100 times and if you get 50 heads, the probability of getting a head again is 51 divided by 102, still 0.5. But if last time, if you got 51 heads, this is going to be 50, uh, 52 divided by 102. That's slightly over 0.51. Uh, because you will agree, if I see 51 heads, maybe P is, we can say, oh, still it is point. So this at least gives you a qualitative way, a quantitative way of exactly computing what the P will be. So let's say you, you got 53 heads, 53 heads in 100 tosses. Uh, so if I don't give you any formula, it's very difficult to see what will be the quantitative number for the next head? You know that 53 heads or 54 heads means it looks like the coin is slightly biased towards the head. The question is how much is the bias? In, if I do the next toss again, or if I'm going to bet based on this, what is the likelihood value? So the likelihood value is if I already got 54 heads in 100 tosses, it is 55 divided by 102. That's what it is. So you know the exact, if I use this uniform model. Of course, initially, if you say, I don't want to use the uniform model, I'm going to start with some a triangular model or something, then you have to uh, recompute it. This answer will be different. But I wanted to give you, so again, uh, listen to the question he asked. The toss, everything is the same as before. The tosses are independent because the coin is just, it's a simple coin. You toss it, toss it. It doesn't matter, even if it doesn't matter what the sequence was before, there is no memory. So, but of course it depends, the head only depends on whatever is the value of P. <coughs> so of course, if you assume it to be P, that's small P. But now, so P is unknown. 
except that with the earlier experiment, we have a better understanding about its distribution function. So this is the way you bring in uh, data uh, to tell you something about the <coughs> how to update the data in machine learning or wherever. So this is the prediction. This is so what it says is, if you toss this coin in it, uh, if you toss it again, the likelihood is uh, of getting ahead is k plus one divided by n by uh, n plus two. But this is, uh, I mean, if I started with the binomial, if I, or now you can go from here. Suppose now I do another experiment, you can go home and see how the by uh, the beta gets modified and so on. So you go from wherever you are. So this is just the beginning you can see. So conditional stuff is something not to be dismissed. That's how you bring in uh, new information into the, into the problem. I am more or less done with this. And now what I'm going to do the rest of rest of one hour or one and all, I'm going to do an application showing everything we have learned. But before I go ahead, let's uh, look at this uh, expected value of GX, just to show you another application. So, so this is by definition, GX multiplied by FXX DX. But fxx dx, I can write in terms of the joint density function, right? And integrate out y. So I'm going to substitute that here. So this is gx multiplied by fxy, x comma y, dy, then dx. So I'm going to put the two integrals together. So then I can write it as gx multiplied by y integral first, then x integral. But this itself I can write in terms of the conditional density function, right? So if you want, I can write this as So notice I flip the integration. So the inside integration is now with respect to X. So this will turn out to be a function of Y, which I can write it as expected value of GX. Remember here, the uh, it is using the conditional density function. So you can say this is condition not Y. Uh, let me rewrite it in the next page so you can read it. So expected value of GX, I can write this as a gx multiplied by fx given y dy. So this quantity is expected value of gx given y equal to y multiplied by fxx dx. So then you are integrating this with respect to fxx dx. So if you call this to be phi y, so this whole quantity is expected value of phi y. So this outside expectation is with respect to y, but the inside expectation is with respect to x. So if you want, you can write it. So, so usually people don't write this X and Y, but it should be known to you. So you, you usually you'll see expressions like this. So previously it wouldn't make sense, but now it should make sense. Expected value of GX, if you want, you can write it like this. Sometimes it has uh, use and so on. 
Uh, and so in particular, of course we know mu x equal to expected value of x. So you can also write, using this formula, you can write this as, so what does this mean? This is the conditional mean of x given y so that's integral x multiplied by x given y dy, I mean dx. And then the outside integration is with respect to uh, a y. Uh, so things like this shouldn't surprise you. Expected value of x is, so of course the inside expectation is with respect to x and the outside expectation is with respect to y. This expectation is with respect to y, but it should be clear from the context. Here, y is given, y is given to be y. So that expectation is with respect to the other variable x. And you will see uh, when we do stochastic processes, I will show you an application of where. So this is called the conditional mean. I mean, same thing goes for probability of x equal to xi uh, given, uh, I mean, and y equal to yj. Of course, you can write it as x equal to xi conditioned on y equal to yj multiplied by probability of y equal to yj, et cetera. Or whatever we said in the continuous domain is also true for the discrete uh, random variable. So look at this problem. So whatever, we are tracking something, maybe the COVID, Corona, uh, distribution, etc. So this may be a borough and we divide Brooklyn, right? Divide it into di different regions. Uh, corona is, uh, has different intensities, etc. But you can see uh, with all these things, uh, everything is, all these variables are random. So whatever we are tracking, the lambda is a, a random parameter. So we are, uh, uh, so when, uh, when, when lambda is given to be a particular value, let's say the value of whatever we are tracking is Poisson like that. So that's, so this Xi is for, for whatever region you are, if you are looking at this region, you will put lambda one here. So that's what I meant by locally Poisson. I'm just making up something again, just to show you. So remember, if you take a big region, a country or a, even a borough like Brooklyn, you have all this uh, Brooklyn Heights, this uh, Park Slope, this and that, right? So remember you keep seeing in paper, whatever is going on, uh, the intensity of this Corona is different in different regions. So they are shutting it off and et cetera, et cetera. So these are the number of cases in, let's say in one of one such place, some K. So if it is uh, a given Lambda is a particular value Lambda, then it has got this distribution. But Lambda itself is a random variable. Let's say Lambda is, I just gave another example. The Lambda itself is varying as exponential with the parameter mu. So the question is, the global behavior will be 
averaged over all of it. For Brooklyn, you want to represent the number, right? So what is the corona behavior over the whole of Brooklyn? Each region is poison, but locally poison, some poison maybe. So this is locally. So remember, we are in Brooklyn, so that's why you used to Brooklyn. Uh, so this could be where we are, Brooklyn Heights, right? Are we in Brooklyn Heights? Where are we, this area? Just, huh? What is it? Downtown. All right, so we can, uh, so remember, probability of A is a probability of A given lambda. So this is what I'm going to do probability of x equal to k. So this is for whole of uh, overall, global. So this is for the whole Brooklyn is probability of x equal to k given the local behavior multiplied by f lambda. Lambda goes from zero to infinity because in our case, look at this problem. I, I assumed it to be some exponential. I'm just making with some parameter mu. So if I do this, this you get zero to infinity, e raised to minus lambda. What was it? Lambda to the power k over k. This is the local behavior multiplied by mu e raised to minus lambda mu. The, and the variable is lambda. I hope you understand whatever is going on, each uh, log, each uh, area, it's uh, uh, something is happening with the parameters lambda one, except that those lambdas are lamb, uh, all variable, random variables, following some other distribution. So if you freeze lambda to be a particular lambda, you get poison. That's the whole point. But here, this lambda is a random variable. So we find to find out the unconditional variation of x for the whole region. We essentially multiply by the, uh, remember this is the formula we have developed earlier. So let me try to simplify this. Mu is a constant, K is a constant. So zero to infinity, we can e raised to minus one plus mu multiplied by lambda, lambda to the power K D. So lambda, it's need to be integrated. So I'm going to call this X. So x is one plus mu multiplied by lambda. So lambda is x over one plus mu. So this comes out to be mu over k factorial integral. Instead of lambda, I'm going to put x over one plus lambda to the power k e raised to minus lambda x. And then, uh, so I took care of this, d lambda, look at here, d lambda is uh, dx over one plus lambda. So that's dx over one plus lambda. So I get, uh, so this is the global behavior. So mu over, I have one plus lambda, one plus lambda, uh, not one plus lambda, one plus mu, I guess. Nobody is paying attention. One plus mu, so it's one plus mu, one plus mu here. One plus mu, one plus mu. So that's going to be one plus mu, one plus mu to the power k. So that's one plus mu to the power k plus one. Then you have k factorial integral zero to infinity, limits will be the same. You have x to the power k e raised to minus, lambda, uh, minus x dx. This, if you check, this is k factorial. So k factorial cancels. So you get uh, this answer, which I'm going to write this is like this. Uh, so, so if I call P to be mu over one plus uh, mu and Q equal to one over one plus mu, 
then p plus q is one. So I can write it like this: k goes from zero, one, two, three, etc. So you know this random variable. What type of random variable is this? P q to the power k. Geometry. So we have a theorem: if local Poisson behavior averaged over exponential is geometric. So remember, this is why microeconomics and macroeconomics is not going to be uh, what you see a micro, what you see in a family level. You cannot duplicate. You can say, oh, okay, all the families are behaving nicely. The country will behave that way. You will never see because each behavior of the each region families behave differently. So overall behavior, just because uh, New York behaves a certain way, that's not the whole U.S. behavior. What? what? So the global behavior is very different; could be different from local behavior. That's the moral of the story. So p is here mu over one plus mu. So to going back, and if you want to fill up the gap, question was: if it is locally Poisson, it is globally in this case geometry. So local and uh, global behavior, micro and macroeconomics uh, can all be will be uh, monetary policy, whatever. Everything is uh, completely different. So the two may not coincide. There may be regions where they coincide. The Gaussian, Gaussian, I believe, will happen. But if it is something else, uh, you'll get a completely different distribution. All right. So I am going to sort of conclude my. Conditional uh, the, uh, discussion here, and go into the next topic of uh, an application, the so-called principle of maximum likelihood. Uh, so, uh, some problems from this will be there on the next test, on from both. So, two topics. Why I am doing this now is this is the right place to use it to show you the applications of probability. This is a topic from statistics. So let me pause here for a second and ask you whether any of you have any questions on what we have just covered. So here, generally, the problem goes like this. You collect data. Usually, these are independent data samples. Generally, uh, some parameter is unknown. So obviously, theta is unknown. I mean, you can have random parameters, but let me uh, stick with, remember, I'm trying to illustrate what we learned so far. Uh, so that the question of all these density, I already showed you a couple of applications earlier today, locally and globally. So before you walked into this class, what does that mean? Global and, and locally are not the same. So, or that uh, coin is unknown. We don't know what the value of P and if I give you some data, can you predict what is going to happen next? So all this we have done systematically, now we can address it. So here the problem is uh, like temperature here in the room or in the city, what's the temperature? So you make some observations here and there. So question is, how do you use these observations to derive? Or what is the humidity? Maybe, maybe more complicated uh, variable. So again, the assumption is data is inherently, because you are making measurements and it has noise and so on. So data is inherently random. So whatever you measure are random variables and that's what we have learned. And they are independent of random variables. 
So question is how, how to estimate the theta. And this is one principle. There are many multiple uh, ideas you can use. This is one idea. So x1, x2, etc. are uh, independent data samples. Usually, they don't have to be independent. So in general, we can assume that they have a joint density function, x1, x2, etc., xn. Uh, so the address also is x1 through xn, but usually I'll just write it as a vector x. So remember, there are uh, we made observations on all these n random variables. They have this, so this is the joint density function. Remember earlier, last two three classes we have studied the joint density function of x and y. So this you exactly do the same way: x less than x, y less than y, z less than z, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the joint distribution function. Take the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, z, etc. That gives you the marginal density, function, joint density. So, but usually the assumption is all these are independent random variables. That may be true, may not be true. But this is where we are going to start with. But for the principle, you don't need independence or anything. Why I keep writing theta here is just to make sure we are not foolish enough to go and collect some data which has nothing to do with theta. Then the suppose this data has nothing to do with theta then you are not going to use this data to estimate theta. Right? That's very clear. So it's your job how to design the experiment. The experiment obviously should be designed so that the data has something to do with the, the, the unknown you are looking for. So that, that's all I'm reminding here. This is not a random variable. That's why I used a semicolon. This is, these are random variable observations. These are random variables. And this is just, uh, obviously these random variables are dependent on that. That's all it says. So this join, this is the joined uh, PDF, right? Joint probability density function. But except that right now, what you have done is you have measured this. This is a measurement, this is a measurement, this is a measurement. So if this is a measurement x1, 0, this is a measurement x2, 0, this is, this is a number, right? Whatever you have measured. Uh, this, is, this is the temperature measured in Central Park. This is LaGuardia, et cetera, et cetera. If this is measured, then in the context of this estimation, I'm going to flip this around. We call this a likelihood function. That's the name statisticians have given to this. Because if you look there, the only unknown is this, the data has been measured. So the likelihood function is only a function of theta. It's not a function of the data. Uh, data has been measured, you plug it in, uh, it's a constant. So it's just, uh, it gets absorbed into the density function. So that's the outlook we use this uh, here. But basically we are dealing with the density, joint density function, which is non-negative of course. So this is non-negative function. So that's where the, uh, so the likelihood function is just a different name. Uh, so we write it like, let's say we write it like this. So that's the joint density, that's still the, this is a fancy name, just the joint density function, except the emphasis is not on data. There's nothing unknown about the data. Data has been measured. What is unknown is theta. So we are emphasizing it as theta. So question is what, this is all we have. You probably, if you are very lucky, you have the joint density function of all the data. All right, question is what do we do next? So this is where uh, this idea is due to Fisher, uh, Ronald Fisher, I think in the previous century, early previous century. So this is, so we are going to go, so the, we use the principle of maximum likelihood. Well, what is that? So remember I explained to you the likelihood function. So his uh, observation, I guess I am obviously putting it in my words. 
is since you have this, you plot that. Remember, now we are not plotting in terms of x1, x2, density function will be plotted usually in terms of x1, x2, et cetera. But these are numbers, the, the observations. So the, obviously the only unknown is uh, theta, but still it is a, a non-negative function. So you plot this joint density function of the data, which is we, so the so-called likelihood function. So remember, the likelihood function is not a function of the un, uh, un, uh, of x1, x2, etc. Cetera, et cetera. The only unknown is theta. So his idea is look at this function and see which value of theta is most likely from uh, is what the data is suggesting as the most likely value. So if you look at this function, we can. Uh, uh, the question is. Is this the most, remember theta is here, what is the most like, or which parameter has got the maximum probability? That's what it is, that's what is the most likely is. So if you look at here, if I take this value and I'm going to call it, let's say theta hat ml, this value has a small neighborhood here has more probability than here, because after all, this is the uh, density function. So uh, you can see this value is more, uh, if you, this small rectangular value is more than this. So this is the most probable because it has got maximum probability here because of maximum probability. This is what you have measured, the likelihood function. How like, so that's why it is called how likely is it? How likely is this value over this value? So if the data peaks around here, then the corresponding theta is the most likely value. This is uh, all you can say about uh, that, the best value for theta, because this is what is suggested by data. In other words, the peak of L theta Theta is what you are looking for. And, uh, and uh, because <coughs> L theta is a probability density function, if I choose this, its probability is uh, smaller than choosing this. So the most uh, in for this, of course, this probability density function is completely dictated by what you observed. If you observed something else, you may get a different density function, but that's not the case. So let's work with what we have. Uh, so this data predicts that uh, peaks here and consequently this is the most likely. So the principle of maximum likelihood is, uh, principle of maximum likelihood. I hope everybody understood this concept. States, uh, choose theta corresponding to the maximum of the joint density function of x1, x2, etc., x xm and theta. This is of course the likelihood of the function. This is one and the same. You uh, choose that value. So that value I'm going to call it theta hat ML. ML stands for maximum likelihood. So sometimes we use the logarithm of the function because logarithm and the function goes the same way, right? The log x actually is like this, right? If this is L, this is log L. So you can choose the maximum of L or maximum of the log likelihood function. So this function is called the log likelihood function. It's one and the same because it's a unimodular function. So same theta. So theta hat ML is the maximum over L or even if you do the maximum over logarithm of L, you will get the same value. So that's the principle of maximum likelihood due to Fisher. 
so sometimes if the function is well defined you can say all right i one way i can do the uh, so i could do this right if the function peaks uh, if the function has a maximum i can take the derivative with respect to theta and equate it to zero and solve for theta hat m but the problem is if the density function is like you may get multiple solutions then you choose the one with the larger peak so remember this is just the joint density function of x1 x etra xn i write it both the ways uh, give one uh, and theta so this is the likelihood function or the log likelihood you can take the derivative with respect to the uh, just the likelihood function also all right so let's uh, do some examples then we will look for properties of estimators and so on so the procedure is you find the likelihood function which is the joint density function of x1 through xn and if the data are uh, is independent we can use the product of the marginal density functions uh, then you take the logarithm then you take the derivative with respect to theta of logarithm of l and it equate to zero that will give you maximum or somehow you find the maximum so that's the principle of maximum likelihood and such an estimator is called maximum likelihood estimator so next week there will be some problems find the maximum likelihood estimator it's called ml estimator so let me do few problems and there are a couple of videos already on this topic i forwarded it you one yesterday so if you check there is one more there are lots of examples solved so maybe some combination of those examples will show so you are going to get some estimator ml estimator and obviously it will be a function of the data so then the question is how good is is this estimator Uh, so the question is how do you measure the goodness so let me ask anyone common sense question if i take this expected value of this estimator what do you expect it to be remember esti esti estimator is a random variable so i can take the expected value if it is a good estimator what do you expect this expected value to be just by common sense very close to each other equal to what i would expect expectation to be very close to the maximum likelihood as no again i'm asking a simple question listen to the question i get, i have an estimator this is a random variable uh, of course this is an estimator for theta theta is unknown so if i take the expected value what do you expect this average value of this estimator to be that's the question i think theta yeah the best theta. thing you can, you can hope for is theta so this property is called an unbiased estimator so this is a this is by common sense unbiased estimator so this we can check is this true or true or false this is one remember i said how good is the estimator this is one property of the goodness uh this is a property the property is that we want uh, so this is a goodness property we want the estimator to be unbiased remember just for common sense because you were able to so any estimator maximum likelihood or otherwise uh such that the expected value of the estimator equal to the unknown we will call it unbiased and similarly what do you expect expect the variance of the estimator to be what do you expect to happen for the variance anybody this variance should be what what should be the trend uh, it may not be zero but you want it to go down right so we want it to at least uh, tend to zero and see whether so this is another goodness property what, what i'm trying to say is we want the variance to be as small as possible how about that so we will check uh, in fact if the if the variance of the estimator uh, goes to zero as you increase the number of observations 
we call this property to be uh, consistent i think so i gave you two properties one is unbiased uh, so, so you can see where i am going see you see these are all uh, properties we learned in this class mean and variance both are used here so the theory is over i'm going to do few examples and your job is to do more examples and get ready for the exam next week so let me start with uh, the standard example so observations are these are the observations or data we are gaussian with some mean and uh, variance so except that as i said as i told you look at the problem mean is unknown for the time being let's say variance is known i'll come to that problem in a minute so this is your theta now that's it so you are told that the you measured some data you are told that the data is our gaussian uh, independent gaussian i want the maximum likelihood estimate so i am going to set up the likelihood function likelihood function is a pro uh, because the data are independent this is the product of the uh, density functions that's the joint density function so each is 1 over square root of 2 pi x squared e raised to minus x i minus mu the whole squared i equal to 1 through n right that's what we learned before divided by 2 sigma squared so let me take the product so the constant is 2 pi sigma squared to the power 3 by 2 e to the power minus x i i all this product becomes here that summation so that's your uh, likelihood function <laughs> so you can see with the exponent etc it makes sense to take the logarithm so let me take the logarithm here so i have to take the logarithm here with, with logarithm of two factors this is just a constant notice there is no theta here theta is sitting here uh, so the the log likelihood function is minus logarithm of this constant 2 pi sigma squared to the power n by 2 then this one minus summation xi minus mu the whole squared over 2 sigma squared that's the log likelihood function now i take the derivative of this log likelihood you can call it a new variable if you want with respect to the unknown which is mu look there is no mu here so that derivative is zero Minus the deriv uh, one over two sigma squared outside summation two x i minus mu multiplied by the derivative of uh, minus mu which is one so minus one so minus minus cancels in any case I substitute this equal to zero so I get the summation x i i equal to one through n equal to n mu I mean I substitute this. At mu equal to mu hat ml, so this is your mu hat ml. So I get my best estimator to be one over n summation. That's called the average mean. But you will say this you knew all the time. But now we know that this is the maximum likelihood estimator for that problem. You you add all the data and divide by n, which is what we do most of the time. so whenever you take the data and and do an average you are implicitly assuming the data is gaussian etc one assumption so let's see how good this estimator is remember two properties we are going to find its mean and variance 
So you have to practice different problems because I'm going to give you a density function and ask you to find the maximum likelihood estimator, find its mean, find its variance. If you make mistakes, then you lose points. So please try this out. Uh, the homework has got a couple of problems. So I'm going to call uh, theta hat uh, to be one over n sigma xi or mu hat. So now I'm going to use things which we studied. So this is theta hat ml or mu hat ml. We can call it mu hat ml. So look, it depends on the data. So this is random variable. So it's uh, expected value is sigma summation xi. Uh, what is the expected value of xi? Going back to the original problem, anybody? If I, remember the original problem, xi are with the parameters mu and sigma squared. So what's the expected value of xi? Mu. Yes. So this is n mu over n. So n cancels mu. So of course this is an unbiased estimate. So this is how you check. So mu hat ml is an unbiased estimate. The next question is what is its variance? In many ways you can do it. Let me do it in the next page. So remember mu hat is uh, one over n sigma xi i equal to one through n expected value of mu hat ml is mu, we just found out. So mu hat ml minus mu is, if I plug it in here, you, you can write it like this. I, I hope you can see it. This much is true. So to find its variance, variance of uh, mu hat ml is expected value of this quantity squared, right? Which is going to be one over n, this quantity squared. So let me call this to be, uh, I don't need to call anything. Uh, variance of uh, summation of i equal to one through n xi minus mu. Multiple ways you can do it. If you look here, I have a sum of a variance of a sum of random variables. Remember, if the random variables are independent, anybody remembers what if x and y are independent, what is the variance of x plus y? We went through this. Huh? What? Some of the way. So here you have a bunch of independent random variables. So the variance is the sum of the variances. By the way, this will be one over n squared because of this query. So this will be one over n squared and all of them are identical and their variance is equal to sigma squared. So this is n sigma squared. You can do it, uh, expand it. So, but, so you, if you know the properties, you can argue quickly. And look here, if as n becomes large, the variance goes to zero. So this is a consistent estimate. So first problem is, this is the way you should do, be doing and you're only going to do this if you solve problems at home, not by just watching it alone. So let me do uh, in the remaining time, few examples. Okay. So let me do a uh, second is, let's say all the XIs are Poisson, but Lambda is unknown. So I want the maximum likelihood estimator for Lambda. So I have independent observations, x1, x2, et cetera, et cetera. All these are independent. So the likelihood function is the joint density function of uh, x1, x2, etc, xn. Uh, and uh, that's the product of the density functions because they're all independent. 
but each of them is e raised to minus lambda x i to the power uh, lambda to the power x i over x i. X i is like k. So this is e raised to minus n lambda. This is lambda. Lambda to the power x one, x two, etc. So this is sigma x i over uh, x i factorial. So that's the likelihood function. So I am going to take the uh, I am going to call this symbol logarithm of the L. So if I take the logarithm of this, you get minus n lambda plus summation x i multiplied by log lambda minus product of log or product log of x i. Right. All right. I take the derivative with respect to lambda. So that's minus n plus sigma x i i equal to one through n over lambda, and this is a constant. So I equate it to zero and solve with lambda equal to lambda hat m. So I get the maximum likelihood of estimator once again to be the same thing. So again, the same question: Is this unbiased, and what is its consistent exit? So let's find out the expected value of the lambda hat ml. That's here one over n summation. Expectation is linear operation. Expected value of x i. Each x i is Poisson. So then this is where, if you know the some results, it helps. So each x i is. Uh, Expected value of x i is lambda. Expected value of x i squared is lambda. Uh, our variance is also lambda. So this is lambda. So this is n lambda by lambda. So uh, n lambda by n. So that's n lambda. So it, they are unbiased estimators. So let's quickly find the variance. So variance of lambda hat ml is lambda hat ml minus its mean squared expected value. So what is expected value of lambda hat ml is what one over x i minus lambda the whole squared. So this you can write it as. Like one over n squared, right? One over n I pull outside. One over n squared, expected value of this. But look at this again. The same way, the, each of these random variables are independent. So the variance of the, or this is the variance of the sum. Many ways you can argue. Uh, So this, of course, is uh, one over n squared expect uh, summation i equal to one through n expected value of x i. So uh, again, here because look at what I have written. This is just the variance of this inside the random variable. Uh, instead of this, so you can also write this as one over n squared variance of that inside random variable, which is x i minus lambda. But these are independent random variables, so the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. So I'm missing a step, but these are the variances of x i. But the variance of x i is lambda from that's the Poisson property. So this is n lambda over n squared. So that's lambda over n also goes to zero. So you just need, to, or you can, uh, if you don't like my argument, you go home and expand this. You'll get double summation. Put all the terms together, you will get this. This is a standard problem. If you look at the other video, you will maybe the steps are a little more, right? 
but I missed something. Let me go back to the first problem and also do this. So this is the first problem on where the data is Gaussian here. Now I'm going to assume that I know the mean, let me do the other way. I don't know the variance, the same problem. So we'll go back to the Gaussian problem. <laughs> so you can do it for all the density functions. Uh, so again, x1, x2, etc., cetera, xn are Gauss, joined, uh, Gaussian, independent, all independent. You can do it, they are not independent also, it gets more complicated. Here, this is the unknown, this is known for the time. And you may say, what if both are unknown? Of course, both are unknown, it's a more complicated problem, but that's uh, for a different course. So this is your theta here. So again, I'm going to find the likelihood function for theta. That's the uh, joint density function of all the, but all these parameters are, all the uh, variables are independent. So I can write it as the product. So if you, I can copy from the previously what I wrote. Uh, mu is known, think of mu as a number two or something or one. So I'm going to rewrite, because sigma squared is what I'm interested, I'm going to rewrite this in terms of sigma squared. Sigma squared I'm going to call theta. So remember sigma squared is theta. So I'm going to take the logarithm, which I'll do it in the next page. So log of L is, remember I need this. So this is uh, n by two log two pi plus log theta with a minus sign both, right? Minus and minus here. Then minus sigma xi minus mu the whole squared divided by two theta. So I'm going to do the derivative of log L with respect to theta. Huh? log two pi theta, right, log two pi plus log theta. That's two, because the, I want to, derivative of this is zero, you can clearly see. So when I do the derivative, I get minus n by two theta minus, this is a constant, the numerator, data has been measured, mu is known. So the derivative is two theta squared, this will become plus, right? Because one over theta is minus one over theta squared. Now you equate this to zero and put theta equal to theta hat, uh, theta hat ml. So you get theta hat ml to be So that's your estimator. Mu is not, so mu is one, let's say, or mu is zero. And data is you just collected. So this is how you estimate your sigma squared ml. Let's see whether your sigma squared ML is unbiased or not. One over N summation expected value of Xi minus mu the whole square. But this is the definition of variance, right? So this is N sigma squared over N is equal to sigma squared. So this is also an unbiased estimator. Now you have to find its variance. Um, uh, so this is the variance of, uh, so I'm going to do, if you know certain results, you don't have to add, attach, address every problem. Xi's are, Xi minus mu is normal with the zero mean and same variance, sigma squared. 
And I don't know whether you remember, if you square a zero mean Gaussian, you get chi squared random variable. So if xi minus mu divided by sigma, if I call this random variable, this is normal with the zero mean and variance one because I divided by sigma. Let me call this to be y, uh, uh, let me call this to be zi. Zi is chi squared, I mean, I'm sorry, normal with zero one. So if you square it, we did this, this is chi squared with uh, one degree of freedom. If I add many of them, that's chi squared with n degrees of freedom. This is uh, uh, a random variable well known, its mean is n, variance is 2n. Or you can do it, look at my video, I did it uh, brute force. And why, why is this? Because this is what I'm going to relate it here. Look at this and look at this. So this is nothing but uh, xi minus mu the whole squared summation i equal to one through n over sigma squared, right? Because if I square, if I ci squared will be ci squared, that will be square of this, which is chi squared. Uh, so look here, this is what we want. So that's going to be uh, z, uh, this random variable multiplied by sigma squared. Sigma squared is a constant, right? So I hope you can follow my argument. Uh, so, so once again, we, let me look at that uh, top line. So I'm going to copy the top line here. Variance of theta hat ML is one over n variance of sigma squared summation zi squared. So let's see whether you, yeah, first of all, I made a mistake before that. Look at here, uh, sigma squared ml is one over n, uh, this thing. So to find the variance, remember, when you, whenever you do the variance, constant becomes constant squared. So this expression should have been one over n squared. And uh, and uh, z, 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 z is here, I square it. Uh, when you square it, you get chi squared. When you add it to our n random variables, you get chi squared with one degree of freedom. So this is chi squared with n degrees of freedom. Uh, zi squared, but what we want is uh, this quantity. So the quantity that we are interested in sigma xi minus mu the whole squared is sigma squared multiplied by this. Uh, the, so let me call this to be a new symbol w. w is chi squared with n degrees of freedom. So you can write it like this. So this is w. So this is one, one over n squared variance of sigma squared, which is a constant multiplied by W. Remember variance of A multiplied by X is A squared. It goes outside. So sigma four divided by n squared variance of uh, W. Well, w is chi squared with the n degrees of freedom because W is, if you don't like this argument, you can do it brute force which is done in uh, that one video I, I on the YouTube. So W is chi squared. I believe the variance of uh, W is 2N. So this, uh, this is uh, 2N because it's a standard random variable, chi squared with N degrees of freedom. So if you put everything together, you get 2N4 over N. Again, this goes to zero. So variance, so that's also a consistent estimator. So again, uh, let me do one problem, which I thought while I was walking here, this is based on one homework. So I don't know the answer, but something from our homework. Let's say FXX is, uh, what was it? So 
say all the xi's have uh, this density function lambda is unknown but it is uh, so lambda is what we need to figure out why am why all that constant in the numerator uh, just, let's just integrate and make sure the area is one so a, this from lambda to infinity so 3 lambda cube integral 1 over x4 dx then lambda to infinity so 3 lambda cube this is what uh, 3 minus 3 multiplied by x cube right lambda to infinity so that is 3 lambda cubed over 3 lambda cubed one so that's the reason this constant storm is free but the lambda is unknown here so this is a little uh, you have, i'm going to i'm leave it to you i'll just sort of uh, run few so we collect uh, we collect the data x1 x2 etc x data question is how do you how do you estimate, what is the maximum likelihood estimator for lambda that's the question here remember this is not uh, uh, exponential or anything it's just uh, something made up a prop so let's go for the likelihood function of lambda that's the product of the density functions so what is it 3 lambda cubed Uh, to the power n, then you have product here x i i equal to one through n. X one is uh, greater than lambda. X two is greater than lambda, etc. X n is greater than lambda. Anybody knows how to put all this together into one condition? This density, this likelihood function is under this condition. How do you put all this together? Anybody? Lambda is less than x one. Lambda is less than or equal to x two. Lambda is less than or equal to x. Anyone? The minimum of all x i is greater than lambda, or equal? Yeah, greater than lambda. What? Each of them is greater than lambda. So the yeah, minimum of like x one, x two, x n is greater than lambda. So you can replace with all this thing. So if I, if you want, you can write this whole thing as uh, remember this is some function g x multiplied by some indicator function of uh, uh, minimum of uh, x i and the lambda. So this is the whole likelihood function. What I am trying the indicator function has precisely this property. Indicator function is one when minimum is greater than lambda and zero. So you don't have to carry this all around. You understand this? I I just explained you indicator of uh, uh, something gamma lambda means that when minimum is greater than lambda, that's one; otherwise, zero. So this is the whole likelihood function. So remember, it's all mess. There is no lambda here. You can see uh, there is some lambda here, but there is also lambda here, lambda here. So you can see this is a case. If I take the derivative how am i going to take the derivative here etc so you have to sort of this is something uh, you are seeing differently so i'm going to draw a graph and see whether it makes any sense how to address this remember this whole thing is i just called it gx just uh, this mess so why this I, i just thought of something as i was walk uh, walking in so let me plot this remember we know the principle uh, so i'm going to plot remember x axis are given so where will this function be look at this this function is a function of lambda but lambda is less than or equal to so where will this function be non negative non zero i meant of course the function is non negative it goes from where to where like it's like it's as a function of lambda look at lambda lambda it's non zero up to
remember it's a, it is being plotted as uh, it's a function of this x1 x2 etc action which you can see here and here anybody Isn't it this? So it says, so lambda, look at here, lambda is less than or equal to whatever is the minimum of this. Lambda, uh, the function is only, uh, as a function of lambda, the function is only up to there, right? So then you have to, uh, uh, actually you have to plot this before that because I see that it's also, uh, but before that you can see, remember it's being plotted, This the denominator is a constant, look at this, this function is, what was it? Uh, oh, where was the L function? Yeah, L function is, uh, yeah, three, not three lambda three, three lambda to the power n. So this is three lambda to the power n over data, but data is fixed, right? X one through. Remember, I should have had a fourth power here, but it doesn't matter, same, uh, same argument here. So x1 to the power 4, x2 to the power 4, etc., xn to the power 4. But these are given numbers. So when you plot this, you see when lambda increases, lambda is going to increase up to here. It's very clear, right? Lambda to the power n. Uh, what was it? Lambda cube. Why am I getting this? Look at here. It was uh, 3 lambda cubed. So 3 lambda cubed. Uh, so this should have been three lambda cube, not three here. Three lambda cube to the power n. So three lambda cube to the power n. So this this goes like lambda cubed, lambda to, to the whatever is the value of n. But it only goes up to here. So this is the likelihood function. So from this graph, what's the maximum likelihood estimator for uh, lambda? Anybody? That's the whole point. See, it's a nonlinear function of the data. You are not going to get this by taking the derivative. So don't jump into derivative on everywhere. Right? And now, of course, you have a new random variable. Call this y. So y is a minimum of x1 comma xn. So I told all these random variables are independent. We want the uh, distribution function of y because to find the mean and variance. So this is probability of y less than or equal to y. This is the same as probability of y. You can go this way, y greater than y. Uh, so one minus probability of minimum of x1, etc., xn, a greater than y. This is a standard technique. So you need to go home and complete it. I'll sort of explain this to you. So this is one minus, uh, minimum is greater than y, then each one is greater than y, right? But then all these are independent. So this is one minus probability of x1 is greater than or equal to y, etc., xn greater than or equal to y. But that's one minus uh, any one of them being greater than or equal to y. There are n of them, but this is one minus fx. So this is one minus one minus fx at y. Yeah. So that's fyy. So if you want small fyy, that's the derivative of this. What do you get? One minus fx of y the power n minus one multiplied by fx of y, right? Minus minus will cancel out. 
f x of y is given to us. What was it? Three lambda cubed over uh, y four. So now you can integrate and find f y y, and then uh, right. So if you want, uh, remember this is one minus f y y is probability of y greater than y. That's what we need. That's uh, y to infinity f y y d y. I haven't done this problem, so you have to sort of uh, work with me. So this is three lambda cubed over, let's say u, u to the power four u four. So you got this, so you got f y y. So we got this. So let me substitute, hopefully I haven't made any mistakes, y cubed to the power n minus one multiplied by f x y, which is three lambda cubed over y four. Y goes from where to where, anybody? If uh, y is the minimum of same as x is, right? So y is also greater than lambda. Hmm? What is it? What did I do? <laughs> Here? There should be an n. Huh? All right, very good. No one else is paying any attention, so there is an N here. All right, this is news to me also. So if I put it everything together, what do you get? Three N lambda to the power three N, right? Divided by Y to the power three N plus four. All right, now I'm going to ask you go home. Remember, what was Y? Why was that minimum, right? Why is, uh, this is what we call the Y, the, your maximum likelihood estimate. So the, mag, the uh, maximum likelihood estimate expected value is the same as expected value of Y. The density function is here. So you just do it, find the variance and see you know, what happens. So it's all easy to do, right? So, so this is going to be y multiplied by f y y d y y goes from uh, lambda to infinity so let's see whether it turns out to be unbiased so this will be 3n and i am also curious decided by 3n plus uh, 3 with a minus sign y to the power um, remember, the, the, so let me plug it in actually before I do it. So if I plug this in here, 3n lambda to the power 3n divided by 3n plus 4, this becomes 3n plus 3. So 3n lambda to the power 3n, 1 over y to the power 3n plus 3, right? dy lambda to infinity. So if I integrate this 3n lambda to the power 3n, what do I get here? 3n plus 2, right? y to the power with a minus sign 3n plus 2. Yes? So lambda to infinity. Uh, so when I substitute the limits, I get 3n over 3n plus 2 multiplied by, unless I did something wrong, I'm going to get to here. So if this is the case, it is not an unbiased estimator, but it's possible I made a mistake. I will also check at home. Uh, but anybody sees anything obvious mistake?
Oh, hold on, let's see with the room. Yeah, 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 I, I made a mistake, I do see. So look at here, the mistake is here, just to, when I do the multiplication here, like three n minus three plus three, uh, so this I copied correctly. Let's just do this correctly. See, look at the power of lambda. 3n, 3n is good because 3n minus 3 plus 3. But the denominator, I didn't do it correctly because 3n minus 3 plus 4. So this is only 3n plus 1 here. It should be 3n plus 1. So let's redo this integration. So this is 3n plus 1 here. Then y y cancels, so there is, is this was just a three n, so this becomes three n minus one. So then uh, this becomes what? This becomes just a three n. So I had three n plus one. Then I multiply by this y and y cancel, so it becomes. Uh, y to the power just a 3n. So here the power is just a 3n. y to the power 3n. That's what it is, the denominator. When I integrate it becomes, so expected value of lambda hat ml becomes integral. Let me write it cleanly. 3n lambda to the power 3n y, y cancel. So I get simply y to the power uh, 3n dy lambda to infinity. So if, let me pull out the constant outside. And then this is 3n minus 1 with a minus 1 lambda to the power 3n minus 1. The, uh, bottom limit is lambda, top limit is infinity. When we put top limit, that's a 0. Minus minus goes away. When you put the bottom limit, you get 3n over 3n minus 1, if I'm correct, multiplied by lambda to the power 3n, here lambda to the power 3n minus 1. So you get uh, 3n divided by 3n minus 1 multiplied by lambda. So it is not quite unbiased because of this constant. Remember, the, so, but because it is a constant, I can flip it on the other side. So if I look at this estimator, so this is a good estimator, this is unbiased. Remember, lambda hat ml was what? Just y, right? So moral of the story is 3n minus 1 divided by 3n multiplied by minimum of x1, x2, etc, xn. This is an unbiased estimator for uh, theta, uh, for lambda. So if I define z to be 1 minus 1 over 3n multiplied by minimum of x1, etc, xn, then expected value of z is lambda, which is what we have been looking for. So z is an unbiased estimator. I hope I haven't made any mistake. So your job is to go home and do what's the variance of z. So it's a good application. You learned the, the theory and this is the uh, this is what is going to happen in uh, in statistics and applications. You want estimators and you want to know how good they are. Uh, so the last problem is a bit messy. I'm just doing it here for the first time. And I hope I did the, uh, the unbiased part correctly. So the max, so here is an example where the, the maximum likelihood estimator is not an unbiased, is a nonlinear estimator because it's the minimum of x1, x2, xn. And uh, its uh, expected value is not lambda, but we can, but it is simply scaled by a constant, fortunately. So we can unscale by the constant here and make it unbiased. Zen, Yang. And uh, I'm going to stop here.